Right. I'm sensing you guys are struggling with this paper. Okay. What is the cause of the struggle? Not understanding what it's saying. Okay, not understanding what it says. Why are you not understanding what it says? It's a really easy answer. Isaac. Well, the format's different. It's just it's just altered the way things are presented. The the methods come at the end, etc., etc., etc. But what's the fundamental difference? You haven't taken the class that talks about this stuff. This is the kind of stuff that you'll talk about in some molecular biology, which isn't this fall. It's next fall, if you're still a biology major then. And so one of the misconceptions that people get, I think, is that you don't have to know all fields of biology in order to make sense of biology. Well, the fact of the matter is, is you guys know some things about ecology and evolution, and you guys don't know squat about some molecular biology. So here's a group of people writing a paper about the evolution of a predator-prey system, but they've gotten to the end of where you can use typical evolutionary biology sorts of techniques to answer the kinds of questions that they have, which is, why are these snakes resistant to tetrodotoxin? What has happened over evolutionary time that has led to these species being resistant to tetrodotoxin? Well, in order to answer those questions, you have to start getting into the cell molecular biology of sodium channels. And so, how many of you, just show of hands, how many of you went and looked up what the structure of a sodium channel was like? Three of you did. I mean, before you came to class today. I realize I've told a bunch of you about this. Okay, how many of you looked at the supplemental materials that are accompanying the paper? You found, okay, so you went and looked at the sodium channel. Unfortunately, their diagram of a sodium channel is really not that great. So uh, let's, um, so how do sodium channels work? Sodium channels are protein. It's a transmembrane protein. And it basically has four subunits that are not illustrated here because this is a cartoon. But you have sodium outside the cell, very little sodium inside the cell. So there's a concentration gradient. And remember that substances travel down concentration gradients, and the bigger the gradient, the faster things travel down. And so normally, the sodium channel is blocked. There are different kinds of sodium channels. There are voltage-gated <coughs> sodium channels, and then there are uh, chemically-mediated sodium channels. Uh, the ones we're talking about are voltage-gated. If there's a change in membrane potential somewhere down here, it will prompt this sodium channel to open. When it opens, sodium flows through, and it changes the charge on the membrane. And so this is what we, we refer to as you know, generating a, a um, depolarization. It's going from a lot of positive ions outside the cell, very few positive ions inside the cell, and then you get all this positive charge coming into the cell. That changes the relative positivity and negativity of the membrane. And this is from the paper, but this is just what a normal depolarization looks like. This is a normal depolarization here. This is a normal depolarization here. Now, if something comes along and blocks this opening, then when this thing goes to open, if there's a physical blockage at the entrance of it, the sodium channels don't come through. You don't get a depolarization. And this depolarization is what causes membrane change here, which then opens sodium channels further down the nerve. And so the blockage prevents the depolarization. It prevents a nerve from sending a nerve impulse down its length. Um, you know, I'm over here. So it turns out there are lots of different kinds of sodium channels. The kind that you're looking at is actually this kind right here. It's made up of four different subunits. They're arranged in a little, a little square cluster such that they make a physical pore at, the, at, the, at this part here. And here they have them, them arranged, subunit one, subunit two, subunit three, and subunit four, arranged in the order that they are arranged in the fully assembled 
assembled sodium channel. And so this is just it blown up. This is the N terminus, the carboxyl terminus. Uh, and you can see that there are linkers linking these three together to see that they're not linked here. Um, this is a better diagram from a different publication of the snake sodium channel with many more snakes than are in your uh, paper showing you where they co-occur with newts and once again showing you the kinds of uh, mutations that are found in the super resistant sorts of snakes. And in the Themnophus uh, atratus, uh, what you have here basically is another species of snake that is super resistant to newt toxin and has this change from aspartic acid to asparagine at amino acid, acid residue 1568. And that is occurring right here. And so it's at the very end of the sodium channel. Sodium channel protein begins here, subunit one, subunit two, subunit three, subunit four, they call these domains. And I don't know why in the publication it should be over. This is domain two should be over here. Domain three should be above this and domain four is above this. But these mutations are all occurring on these, these linkers linking one section of a domain to the other sections of that same domain. And the ones that have super resistance all have this change from aspartic acid to asparagine at this particular amino acid residue. And so what they found in this paper when they looked at not resistant, somewhat resistant, pretty resistant, really, really resistant, is once again, all of them have this change to valine, but that can't explain differences in resistance among all of these snake populations, because they all have that one. The only super resistant one is once again, something that has these two amino acid changes here and this amino acid change here. And as it turns out, when they then went further and found other snake species that were also resistant, the thing that was implicated primarily was at 1568, uh, amino acid 1568. So now they know what the gene is, so what did they do? You guys struggled with this idea of chimeric DNA. Well, what they did was they took a sodium channel gene out of humans, isolated it out of humans. Actually, you can just order these on, on, from chemical supply companies. You can get a copy of the gene, and what they did was they just took this last section of domain four, took it out, and put snake DNA in there. So now they have a chimeric DNA made up of mostly human DNA with a little bit of snake DNA. And when they do this, they can now control what part of the sodium channel is actually being experimentally manipulated. So they took this human DNA, they took off a little bit of it, put on some snake DNA, and then they inserted that into a frog egg, frogs of the genus Xenopus. The nice thing about frog eggs of the genus Xenopus is that they, um, they're embedded in the back of the female for incubation. Uh, she produces a lot of skin and, that grows up and around the eggs and, and nourishes them. But the other thing about them is they're big. They're big enough that you can play around with them. And so they used a method called patch clamping that allows them to measure the membrane potential on membrane, the charge on membrane. And so they took the human snake chimeric DNA. The chimeric DNA was made up of snake DNA from each of these populations of snakes. And then those frog eggs built sodium channels. And they built sodium channels that were mainly sodium channels built from human DNA, but then the last little bit was built from snake DNA, the part that is variable. And so they used the frog eggs to express sodium channels, and then they tested to see whether or not those sodium channels were resistant to tetrodotoxin. Isaac. So why is human DNA involved in, in the mix? Because they, they, they showed that there was no real difference between the two. Is it just it's easier to handle? No, nope, it's just a control so that if they missed something further upstream. So, so remember also that they used reverse transcription. So remember from Central Dogma back when Dr. Reynolds was talking to you about genes. 
central dogma basically begins with DNA. DNA is transcribed to messenger RNA in this case. And then that messenger RNA is translated, whoa, translated into a protein. <coughs> But after this DNA is transcribed into RNA, this RNA goes through what's referred to as post-transcriptional processing. Anybody know what this is? Is this where you cut out the useless bits? And you cut out the useless parts, yes. What else do you do to it? Some things are attached at the end. Yep, you add a poly A tail. This is just basically taking the messenger RNA strand, and then at the end of it, you add a bunch of adenines to it. The cell does this before the messenger RNA is shipped out of the nucleus into the cytoplasm. So what they did was, there's not a genome available for garter snakes. They've made a proposal to sequence the genome of garter snakes, and it's never been funded. Um, so what they did was they started with the express genes. So looking at transcriptome, which genes are being transcribed into RNA? And so you begin with a messenger RNA strand, and you're going to use a type of transcriptase, uh, 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 enzyme that does transcription. But rather than transcribing DNA to RNA, you can use reverse transcriptase. to transform RNA back into DNA. That's what cDNA is, is DNA that has been formed from the reverse transcription of RNA. And anytime you're transcribing using, using a PCR machine, anytime you're transcribing DNA into more DNA or DNA into RNA, or RNA back into DNA, you need a primer. And the primers that you use for reverse transcription are primers that just have a bunch of thymines here. And so you begin at the end of the gene, and you go backwards on the gene. So when the genes that, that code for this sodium channel are expressed, it starts here and goes this way. It's all linear. And so in the messenger RNA, the poly A tail would have been down here. And so when you do reverse transcription, you start at this end and go backwards. And because sequencing isn't very efficient in many cases, you don't have thousands and thousands of, of, uh, of nucleotides that get sequenced. You only have maybe 500. And so you're not actually getting a cDNA fragment that has all of this. You're getting a cDNA fragment that maybe only has one or two domains worth of, of cDNA. And so they used human DNA in case some parts that didn't get transcribed through reverse transcription, if there are changes in here, they wouldn't know about them. They only know about the changes in the latter part of the molecule because of the way in which they went about getting their cDNA. So um, they added human DNA because we do know what the structure of sodium channels are in human DNA. And so that was constant from one, one frog egg to another frog egg. And so the only thing that they were changing was this little bit at the very end. Does that help? Does that make sense? OK. So they're not just trying to be freaky, Frankenstein-y sort of scientists. They actually have an actual reason for, for doing this. So they took human DNA, combined it with snake DNA, and stuck it in a frog. And then the frog egg generated the altered sodium channels so that they could then test the effect of tetrodotoxin. And the way they did this was by um, looking at the difference in the, the blockage of sodium channels and the blockage of current generation in situations where there were, um, in this case, um, Snake DNA versus chimeric DNA to show that making chimeric DNA doesn't really matter. 
when you put snake DNA, a full snake DNA in there, it behaves essentially the same as a human snake chimera. So then they just went ahead with the human snake chimeras and illustrated that the chimeric channels that they generated express the same kinds of resistance that they see in, in, um, in nature, such that the amount of tetrodotoxin required to block 50% of the channels basically goes up as you go from Bear Lake to Warrington, sorry, Bear Lake to Warrington to Benton to Willow Creek. Willow Creek requires a lot of tetrodotoxin to block 50% of the channels. And then this is just looking at Willow Creek showing what the effect of the residue at 1561, that uh, change from, from isoleucine to leucine, only results in a doubling of concentration required to block 50%. So it doesn't account for this gigantic difference between, for example, Willow Creek and Benton. And then this is just showing the actual depolarization curve for um, the Bear Lake population without tetrodotoxin present, which looks like just a normal depolarization wave. But this is it when it's subjected to a certain concentration, which is down here somewhere, 100 nanomolar of TTX. And it's basically effectively shut down that, those sodium channels to the point that it can't generate a, a change in membrane charge. However, here, it looks like it's all a red line, but if you blow it up on your, on your PDF reader, it's a black line and a red line. The black line is the normal depolarization. The red line is the depolarization under 100 nanomolar tetrodotoxin. And this is for Willow Creek. And you see that the depolarization hasn't changed at all. And so a concentration of tetrodotoxin that basically shuts down sodium channels at Bear Lake doesn't have any effect on sodium channels at Willow Creek. <coughs> and so then this is just a diagram showing how skeletal muscle behaves under varying concentrations of, of tetrodotoxin versus how the cloned channels do. And you see that there's a pretty good correlation. The cloned channels in the egg respond kind of like how whole organism performance changes when you're looking at skeletal muscle. And so they're basically saying that the important part of the sodium channel that matters is this part at the end and they're also claiming that it's this one residue right here going from aspartic acid to asparagine. What do you guys know about amino acids? <coughs> Asa. A lot. What, what do you know? What can you tell me about amino acids? I'm sorry? Okay, so they, they have they have a constant a constant structure, and there's one side chain that varies from one amino acid to another. Uh, what what about those side chains is important? Yeah. So yeah, it's repeats. It's, it's, it's. Okay, so the, the amino acids are, are part of polymers that make up proteins. What else do you know about amino acids, Isaac? Anything to add? Well, the, those uh, side chains, they, based on which side chain is there, the different amino acids along the chain will interact with each other, and the, the protein will fold differently. Why do these things interact with other parts of the protein? What is special about them? Or not so special. It's common in chemicals. Oh, crud, I don't have this. They're polar. OK, they have charges. Uh, hold on. I messed up. No, no, don't go there. Or wait, maybe I do have it. Oh, come on, really? Of course. No, not there.
You guys know what this is? Isaac? Uh, the translation between the, the amino acid and nucleic acid. Uh... Okay, so <coughs> when, you're, when you're transcribing DNA into RNA, you get an RNA code, and then that RNA code gets translated into proteins, but that translation is done by three unit codes called codons. So this is basically a codon chart, and it's basically showing the different kinds of, of uh, sequences that lead to different kinds of amino acids being coded for. This is aspartic acid, this is asparagine. So to go from aspartic acid to asparagine, the only thing you actually have to change, this is adenine, adenine uracil, adenine, adenine cytosine. This is guanosine, adenine uracil, and guanosine, adenine cytosine. So you're just trading out an adenine for a guanine, and these are the same type of amino acids. They are pyrimidines. And so this is what is known as a transition mutation, and it's the most common kind of single nucleotide poly polymorphism. So all you have to do is change one nucleotide to get from aspartic acid to asparagine. Well, why is this important? Well, because aspartic acid is a polar molecule or can also be considered a negatively charged molecule. And asparagine is a positively charged molecule based on, once again, the structure of the side chain. So this is the, this is the mutation going from this to that, polar or negative to positive. So it's changing the charge. When you look at tetrodotoxin, what do you notice about the structure of the molecule? What do you know about hydroxyl bonds, OH groups? What do you know about the interaction of oxygen and hydrogen? Well, that's polar. Yeah, oxygen is an electronegative atom. It sucks electron density away from hydrogen. So all of these hydrogens are partially positive. When you go from aspartic acid, which is a negative molecule, to asparagine, which is a positive molecule, you put that molecule up against tetrodotoxin that has a full positive charge here and all of these partial positive hydrogens around the edge of it. You now have, with asparagine there, a positive charge interacting with a positive charge, those things repel one another. Tetrodotoxin can't bind as well. With aspartic acid, which is what you have in non-resistant snakes, you have a negative charge interacting with this positive charge. You get strong binding there. And so at a molecular level, there's a good reason why changing this one amino acid residue alters the ability of tetrodotoxin to bind to that sodium channel. It has everything to do with the structure of the toxin itself combined with the change in amino acids that are happening in the structure of that sodium channel. I'm an ecologist. Guess what? I have to know a certain amount about physiology and cell molecular biology to do my job. Questions? Does this make sense to you? We're going to revisit this some more on Friday because they're going to talk about the interaction between the newt and the snake and why one of them seems to be evolving faster than the other. I've given you some information today that will hopefully help you with that paper as well. Bye-bye.